In this experiment, we're going to be studying a pendulum. So you're going to take your IO lab and attach it to a string. I've got mine on a paper clip here. And then to study the motion of a pendulum, you just swing this back and forth. Now the idea here is that the period, the time it takes the pendulum to swing all the way over and all the way back, that period is related to the length of the pendulum. So from the point of support to the center of mass. The equation that governs this is given in your lab manual, but there's one thing you need to be aware of, and that is that that equation is only valid for small angles. So you need your angle to be small. You can't swing your pendulum from something like this, for example. So just keep your angles very small, so about like that. And another thing that'll help with this is to only use longer lengths of the pendulum. So I would recommend that 25 centimeters is your minimum pendulum length. So you want six to eight data points, and I would say 25 centimeters would be your minimum, and then you can go up to a maximum of a meter or a meter and a half. So you want six to eight data points, you choose the increments, but I would recommend no shorter than 25 centimeters. Another thing to be careful of is when you're measuring your lengths, make sure that the string is stretched out just because it's going to be stretched when you're doing the experiment. So if you're measuring it, just make sure you stretch the string. And another thing to be careful of when you're doing this is always make sure that you've got your arm braced against something when you start swinging it. The reason why is that if your arm's not braced, then the pendulum starts swinging, that rocks your arm back and forth, and that actually saps energy from the pendulum and it'll stop swinging faster. So brace your arm on something and just hold your hand very steady when you're doing the experiment so that you don't rob the pendulum of energy. Finally, we're going to be getting the time for one complete oscillation, t, from our graph. We're actually going to measure 10 of them and then divide by 10 to get the period of one oscillation. Now an oscillation is one complete back and forth motion like this. So if this is my starting position, it's all the way over, all the way back is one oscillation. As I said, we're going to get that by looking at the force probe on our sensor, but you want to think about what you're going to be measuring from the force probe. So if you think about this situation right now, think about the free body diagram for this. So we've got tension force pulling upward, gravity pulling downward, the sensor's not moving up or down, therefore they must be balanced, therefore the tension force that we're measuring should just be equal to the weight. So that's true in this position. When it's out here, however, now the tension force that we're going to measure is going to be the weight times cosine theta, where theta is the angle that the pendulum makes from the vertical. So we expect to get a maximum force here and a minimum force over here. So like I said, one complete swing of the pendulum is from here all the way over, all the way back. That's one oscillation. But now think about what the force is going to be doing. It'll be minimum, maximum, minimum again, maximum again, minimum again. So our force graph is going to have a period that is one half the length of the pendulum's period. So we need to be a little bit careful about that. So you're going to take data at various lengths, you'll get the period for all of them, and then you're going to graphically verify the equation that governs a pendulum when it's oscillating with a small angle. So now let's talk about the theory for a moment. This is the equation that governs a pendulum. So the time it takes to swing back and forth once, the period, t, is related to the length of the pendulum, l, by this equation. And your job in this experiment is to graphically verify this relationship. However, there's one problem, and that is that this is not a linear relationship. It's a square root relationship. So if you graph t versus l, you're not going to get a straight line on your graph. You should get a line that looks like this. Now it is possible to analyze the shape of curved graphs, but it's a little harder. So we're going to play a trick that'll make our lives a little easier. We're going to do what's called linearizing the data, which means we're not going to graph t versus l, even though those are our two variables. Instead, we're going to graph a function of t versus a function of l that we expect to give us a straight line. Now there's two ways to do it with this equation. So we can see that t is related to the square root of l. So what we could do is graph t versus the square root of l and then we do expect to see a straight line graph. The second way to do it is to graph t squared versus l. Again, if we do it that way, we expect to see a straight line. And in fact, the template spreadsheet that I've given you sets it up this way. It's expecting you to graph t squared versus l. Now, the reason why we expect this to give us a straight line rather than a square root relationship is because if you square both sides of the equation, you end up with this form here t squared equals 4pi squared over g times l. 
And if you compare that to the equation of a straight line on a graph, y equals mx plus b, you can see that if we plot t squared on the y-axis rather than t, and l on the x-axis, that the theory predicts that we should get a straight line graph where the slope is equal to 4 pi squared over g, and the y-intercept is predicted to be equal to 0. So that's what you're going to check. You're going to graph your data, but you're going to graph it as t squared versus l, and then you're going to check. Is the graph linear within uncertainty? Does the slope equal the value I expected within uncertainty? And does the y-intercept equal the value that I expected within uncertainty? Now you can check that your slope is equal to 4 pi squared over g, but in this experiment they actually do want you to find the value of g. So it's equivalent to actually calculate g and then check whether it equals the accepted value of 9.81 meters per second squared. That's equivalent to checking your slope, so I recommend you do that. So the question is, how do you get g from your graph? Well, like I said, the slope is predicted to be equal to 4 pi squared over g. So what you do is you calculate the slope of your graph. That'll be a number. You set it equal to 4 pi squared over g, and then you solve for g. So you do not input a value of g into the expression. Instead, you take your slope value, set it equal to 4 pi squared over g, and then solve for an experimental value of g, which will have an uncertainty on it. And then you check whether your experimental value of g equals the known value within its limits of uncertainty. So you'll verify that your graph of t squared versus l is linear within uncertainty. You'll verify that your value of g is equal to the known value within its limits of uncertainty. And you'll check whether your y-intercept is equal to zero within its limits of uncertainty. If you can say yes to those three things, then you have graphically verified the equation governing the motion of a pendulum. Now just one last thing before we go back to taking data. The reason why we linearize data like this is that it is just easier for the human eye to see the difference between a straight line and a curved line, whereas finding the difference between a curved line and a different sort of curved line is a little harder for our brains. So if you linearize your data, but your graph doesn't end up looking like a straight line, that's really obvious to you. And that's the main reason why we linearize data. So now let me show you how you take data with this experiment. So to do this experiment, you're going to have your force probe selected, and you have your pendulum set to a length that you've measured. And you just want to swing it, again, with your arm braced against a wall or something, and measure the time it takes for 10 oscillations of the pendulum. So I'll click record and start this guy swinging with a small oscillation. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and that should be fine. So I'll stop that, and now let's take a look at our data. So here's our data. So let's first zoom in on the oscillations. Now those are a little clearer to see. And we want to count off the time for 10 complete oscillations of the pendulum. But like I said, this graph, this force graph, is going to go through minimums and maximums at twice the speed that the pendulum was, just because the force here should be at a minimum at both ends of the pendulum swing. So that means we want to count off 20 of these oscillations in order to get the time for 10 oscillations of the pendulum. So you go back to your histogram, and you would just count them off. So that would be one oscillation of the graph, and two oscillations of the graph gives us one swing of the pendulum. So two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, and this would be twenty. So that's the time we're looking for. Remember to come up with a reasonable uncertainty for it. And again, you're going to take your ten oscillations of the pendulum and divide by ten to find the period of the pendulum.